Um, the next panel is Eyes on the Prize, the Leaders in Education and Skilling. Um, as you all know, education is visceral to the DNA in India. And uh, for all of us that grew up here from our ancient scriptures, texts, um, old gurukuls, um, education has been an integral part of our culture. So it is no surprise that India has emerged as a powerhouse for education innovation companies. So now I have the pleasure of introducing a panel of exceptional Indian founders that have built leading companies in education and skilling. Please join me in welcoming Chaitanya Kalina Pat Patnapu from Emeritus, uh, Krishna Kumar from Simply Learn, Mayank Kumar from uh, Upgrad, and Pratik Maheshwari from Physicswala. And leading this discussion will be Karan Singh of Bain and Company. So let's uh, let's get started. This is a exceptional panel. I think uh, we were just spending a few minutes outside, and I think the experience here is absolutely mind-boggling. So. And I have a lot of questions in our 45 minutes, which I'm not sure we'll, we'll get through all. So, but thank you all for joining. Um, I'm going to start a little bit about, uh, start with where things are today, the current situation, and then flip a little bit to what's going to happen tomorrow. So Mayank, I'm going to start a little bit with, uh, with you on the current reality. I think we've all been reading the papers. We're all quite familiar with um, everything we are hearing about the situation in the market but bring it to life in terms of what is the situation uh, from the funding perspective, from the uh, customer, uh, customer perspective, and how are you responding? On the call, right? Uh, okay, <laughs> so I think, tech, I mean, what's happening, I mean, everybody's aware that uh, yeah. we were living in an era of uh, almost zero interest rate and free money sort of floating into the ecosystem. So therefore, a lot of capital did get deployed, and uh, like all of us, we were left with... Uh, the only choice is let's use that capital and grow rapidly. And therefore, I think last two years was very clearly focused on growth, at, grow at any cost. And that was the ecosystem sort of general perception uh, and approach that let's grow and let's grow rapidly and um, take up lion's share of the market and build the market out. Because online to that extent is a market that exists but doesn't exist as well because uh, there's a lot of... Uh, still apprehension about the online ecosystem. So all the companies came together and invested and built the market out. But today, when the capital is um, not as easily going to be available, there is a greater push. And on the ground reality, Karan, is that um, anything which is non-core, let's park for the time being. Anything which is largely experimental and for future sort of uh, growth trajectory, park it for the time being, focus on the core, make your core stronger, and ensure that the core is profitable and sustainable. So a lot of focus and push has been on profitability. A lot of focus has been on what's the growth at the right cost and not growth at any cost. Uh, a lot of focus, I mean, there are three or four costs which are largely the biggest cost for all ed tech companies. One is marketing and customer acquisition. The second is teacher cost and the faculty and the university cost. And the third is payroll. Uh, and those are the three things that typically drives. So I think on all three costs, um, founders are taking a lot more um, <coughs> thoughtful decisions and not decisions that will just sort of mean that, look, let's hire 1,500 people and grow. But let's hire the right 1,500 people that will give me CM2 positive. And if it is CM2 positive, I'll continue to grow and, and, and get into the growth trajectory. So that's the shift that has happened. It's a cultural shift. It's not just a... a uh, I mean, I always feel that the, 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 the time span of changing behavior is very, very short. Just six months back, it was a different conversation, and today it's a very different conversation. So everybody's hoping that six months later will be a very different conversation, but everybody will come out being much more sustainable uh, in the long run during this period, and that's a good thing for the ecosystem. It's a cultural and a structural change, I'm guessing, right? So what you're saying, it's a profit from the core. Chaitanya, why don't you tell us what, how you're responding? Yeah. So, if we look at the, the global picture, right, so education, global education is seven trillion approximately in terms of market, and uh, delivered through online is only 5%. Yep. As a sector, if you look, compare with any other sector, it's extremely, um, it has very low penetration with respect to digital. So if I look forward, I think the opportunity is immense. So there are no two ways about it. So what has uh, changed or what has, uh, uh, what, what has been reiterated over the past one and a half, two years is that 
we are out there, we should be out there to create value and not valuation. Right? And uh, to Mayang's point, what that means is that how can you grow profitably and uh, how can you create value for your uh, investors, for your shareholders, as well as stakeholders, be it your employees, be it your uh, partners, vendors, et cetera. Uh, and uh, uh, grow responsibly or grow profitably. I think that's what's been uh, uh, re-emphasized over the past one and a half years. And uh, I'm extremely bullish in terms of uh, the growth all of us would experience. And there's lots all of us would uh, need to do in terms of driving more impact. Yeah. So what has changed uh, and what is new on the value creation side compared to what you were doing? And then for all of you, you guys raised at very high valuations. <coughs> so what's the metric or that you're solving towards to you know, get attractive valuations? And what's, what's your sense, uh, Chaitanya? So I have uh, an Krishna, I'm going to come to you next. So I have an anecdote. In fact, uh, last time when we raised around, um, uh, obviously in the media, you know, you're a unicorn valued at uh, 3.2, et cetera. So I was uh, showing this article to my son, who's, who at the time he was eight years old, my daughter six years old, uh, that, you know, that uh, Emeritus is a unicorn. Uh, she, they were just reading the article. Then my daughter looks at me in her infinite innocence and says, so Papa, your company is not real, is it? That's what her <laughs> asked. Uh, I said the company is real, but maybe the value is not. So I think that's the point we all have come around, right? In terms of, uh, to your point, what are we driving is that how do you drive growth? Because there is growth, but at the same time, uh, one is the unit economics, the second is, uh, uh, to Mayang's point, how do you have a good reign on your indirect cost, right? And, uh, you know, grow profitably. Uh, so the aspect on uh, the focus on EBITDA is much more pronounced now than what it was earlier. And it was not a wishful thinking that, okay, you grab the revenue, everything will work out for itself. I don't think that's, um, that's going to happen. So what will drive valuations, uh, Krishna or uh, Pratik? I know we'll come back to you. You've got an exceptional story on, on unit economics and profitability. So we'll hold that for a minute. But uh, as you think about valuations going forward, what are you... What do you think will drive the, the key metrics that you're working towards, which is a good business, profit from the core, but... So, Karan, I am the only non-unicorn here. So I'm real. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you're the real, <laughs> the real deal. So, we're real. See, for, so we, are, we are also not a very new business. We have been in the business for, I think, 12 plus years. So we have seen multiple cycles in, in our last 12, 12 years of journey. And very, very focused on um, creating customer outcomes, right? So I think... That's what gets us repeat. That's what gets us more and more users. In the last couple of years, like post-COVID, we saw easy uh, money was easily available. So a lot of money uh, went on, on acquiring customers. A lot of spend happened on marketing. But I think all of us have learned that does, that doesn't really that doesn't work. Right? While you can throw money at the customers, you can create eyeballs, but that does not necessarily result into a sustainable business. So that has been one of our... So I think we always believed that that's true, but it got reinforced to us as a business that... The sustainable growing business is the business that creates value and, and that's a business that, that will attract uh, good value over a period of time also. So for us, the mantra remains the same, right? Do real work, create real outcome, and everything else will follow. And define outcomes for... Outcomes, so, so we are in the business of uh, reskilling, upskilling, right? As long as our learners come take up Simply Learn program and they can show that they have gone up in their, their career and, and, and eventually in life by getting a promotion, by getting a new job, by switching their track from, from one track to another track, I think that's f an outcome for us. Like just now, I think the first meeting that I had in the conference, I met one of the investors of a large private equity, not invested in Simply Run, but uh, uh, a very, very popular name. And he was saying, Yaar, paansal data, uh, paansal experience of data science ke log kahan se milenge? So he is an investor in a lot of in a company that provides uh, data science and data analytics kind of services. I'm saying that we are not we are we have so much of work to do, but we are not able to find five plus years of experience professionals who know data at the price that we want to pay. It's like crazy. So there is a need for trained professional even in the current market also. While there's a lot of layoffs happening, while there's so much of a struggle on getting talent, there are there is work there, but there's not enough people. So what has also happened in the last three years, and it's, again, it's good for the ecosystem, is that we all have together spent a lot of money in, in creating this awareness that if you reskill, upskill, learn something, there is value. So that, that has also got established. So that's, that's a good part. That all that money has not gone for waste, right? People have realized that you can reskill and become more valuable, and you can reskill online. The debate of online versus offline is, is also largely settled in favor of online. That medium doesn't matter, the real learning matters. 
Excellent. Prateek, what you're telling me outside is absolutely mind-boggling. I'd love for you to share this with the audience on, uh, forget this year's profitability, it's still very good. But at 57% uh, last year, I think it's exceptional. And everything you're talking about is sensible growth, is profitable growth. Just bring to life kind of how are you thinking about, you know, this amazing success. This is another f amazing financial outcome. And what's your philosophy behind that? Um, in terms of the unit economics and... Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Karan. So, uh, like, you know, uh, from, from philosophy point of view, like, you know, so we just, we just have one playbook, is like build great communities of learners. Like, you know, so community, uh, 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 making a great community is for forever, like, you know. So, uh, what we do is we, we provide a lot of free content and, like, you know, we drive a lot of engagement through that content and we don't have a metric called customer acquisition in our company like you know so like you know it's 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 the community which we which we try to create and then we try to monetize over those communities so that's how we started uh, doing it and that's the only way we know uh, of doing this business and in the current times like you know uh, like you know the markets are always up and down like you know so so downtime is temporary i wish like you know there is a upturn again but uh, for good, good assets, there will be always a good value attached to it. And uh, as uh, uh, Krishna said and uh, Chaitanya said that like, you know, the value creation is more important. And the yardstick to measure the value creation is the learning outcome, which, uh, which is the core of any edtech. Like, you know. So for us, the results are the learning outcomes. Like, you know, the students which goes to IIDJ colleges and medical uh, uh, medical colleges is is uh, is two x jump from the last year. Like, so the learning outcome is the key. Like, and the learning outcome is tied to your CAC. So communities uh, like you know great community formation is tied to CAC. Like you know if you if you able to uh, create great communities like you know are very engaging uh, uh, communities, then you can solve the problem of customer acquisition. Then you need not to go. Uh, to Google or Facebook and spend millions of dollars to yeah. acquire customers. And what is your CAC? So, like, with, like I said, like, you know, we don't have that metric in oh, You in don't? Uh -huh. Seriously? <laughs> 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 I, don't, I don't know. I think, I think our three other panelists do track CAC. So, yeah. is there any advice you want to give them? On? No, I think the one point that uh, coming out is that learning outcome is the sort of main mantra and the where it sort of sh shows up on the PNL is customer acquisition cost. Like, more people will come to the community if he has better outcomes. More people will come to somebody who has delivering on career outcomes. So, and education is not like, uh, I mean, it's not an instant gratification product. It's not like you eat a chocolate and you enjoy the taste. It takes one year or six months or two years to eat the chocolate and then you have an anticipation of a taste, uh, that it will taste good. And that's the reason why many a times in education you have to have that patience to deliver outcomes. And once you have enough, yep critical mass of outcomes, you will start seeing CAC falling Absolutely. down. And that's where, like today, when we, I mean, as Upgrad, if you're sitting, for us, we do have a CAC metric. Uh, if you're sitting at a CAC number, our only thought process is how do we reduce our reliance on the, the paid engine and organic and word of mouth? Because at the end of the day, if the word of mouth is not happening, then you have not built an education company. We are just talking about getting customer in and throwing customers out. No, you absolutely need to get the flywheel to work. But what you guys are saying is actually a, a very sensible where it's uh, structurally looking at profitable growth, it's profit from the core, it's focusing on outcomes, getting that to fuel the acquisition costs. So this is very much sounding like, a, like an offline business, to be honest, like where we consult. But t t talk a little bit, let's shift gears and talk a little bit about uh, the future of EdTech. I went to ChatGPT, and ChatGPT says the future of EdTech in India is very attractive. That's two-year-old, couple of years old data, but now given we've got the four of you gurus here, what is the future of EdTech? So future is very, very bright. Our partners are sitting here. So Debra is an investor in us, so how can I lie here? <laughs> <laughs> so future Deborah's is very happy. Bright. Yeah. So, uh, like, uh, especially, like, like uh, uh, Chaitanya has said, like, you know, very little uh, digital penetration have happened in India, like, and a uh, lot more digital inter internet penetration, hardware penetration, the bottom of the pyramid, 
the real way to solve uh, a problem, a good quality education problem, is the technology. And like you know, and uh, like we solve, uh, we have created a product for Bharat. Like you know, eighty percent of the uh, audience were uh, filling the examination forms, but were not able to afford. Uh, quality education. So we have created a product and disrupted a price price by one twentieth of of the existing players. Uh, so, uh, uh, like you know, the true potential will be from tier through tier three, tier four, five cities, where the availability of good teacher is is a is a true challenge. So that's that's a market like you know uh, that's a huge market which will unveil in in upcoming years. Yes, I also want to add that if you look at uh, India as a country, unemployment is a big problem. Some of us are fortunate to work in tech where for every individual there are multiple jobs, but majority of our country men, they don't have so many job options, right? So I think one of the biggest benefit of tech is that if you learn some of the skills that are in demand globally, you can work remotely from India. So that, that we see as a big yep. opportunity and, yep. and the last part of our, of our user base are the ones who are learning and getting some meaningful employment compared to what they are currently doing. But there's also a challenge, right? See, tech companies are generally pretty well known. They are available on, uh, on they are also like, um, uh, no, become relatively bigger than offline player. You can be a small offline campus, and if the moment you become online and become a size of, of a certain size, then you are pretty like uh, um, known, in, known in the market, right? And one of the challenges that I have seen in, uh, in our business is that, and Mayank also touched upon it, uh, it that it tech is not or or it tech is not a instant gratification business. So it's not an e-commerce that you go buy a product, the product arrives at your home, you consume the product, and you feel very good about it. It tech is a category where you buy a program, and that's where the hard work starts. I'll not say that it's it's a chocolate test. Maybe it's a bitter test because you have to start working hard to learn the program before you you realize the benefit of the, of the program. Many times we have seen that uh, the expectation from learner is that I bought a program, so I should get immediate benefit, right? So I think some of those things also, if it improves, I think the, the future of ethic will become even more bright, where there is a re realization that this is an opportunity to get in. By the time you get out, you'll be a, you will you'll actually realize the, the fruits of what you have bought. And Chaitanya, in the next chapter, how is that going to be different than the last couple of years? So, uh, first of for EdTech, it's it's an ex it's extremely broad, you know, talking from K through 12 to secondary. Uh, if if we just uh, higher education and above is just like 30 percent of the market. If I talk about the opportunity here, you can only imagine how the opportunity in K through 12 would be. One on the individuals, if I separate to B to C and B to B, so on the individual end, one is I think lifelong learning has become a paradigm. It, it's here to stay. I think my degree, which maybe I've uh, I've done in 2006, has already expired, thanks to the you know the changes, uh, the incessant changes that are that are happening. So how do you continuously skill yourself and stay relevant? It's going to be very important. I think that's where there's a lot of opportunity, and uh, I, I read this somewhere that uh, uh, education without skilling leads to unemployment, and skilling without education leads to unproductivity. So the idea there is that how can you develop that? outcomes at the same time so that person is very relevant to the job that they do because there is a, although there is an upskilling opportunity, there is a huge gap in terms of employability of uh, graduates who are coming out and at the same time uh, are they employable or not. So I think that's one big uh, segment that can be addressed and uh, um, that's quite viable. The second thing, uh, I think uh, IIT Madras had led the way here in terms of stackability. So it's, a, it's an earlier notion, to, it's a stereotype to say that I should complete my undergrad in three or four years, postgrad in two years. Now they have launched, I think it's been two years, their uh, bachelor's in data science, uh, which is like a three lakh pro, uh, rupee, uh, where you could do a certificate, you could do a diploma or a degree at your pace. So I think the stackability part is something that's going to change and which is going to create a lot of opportunity. Yeah. Last thing, maybe there are multiple in, um, opportunities in B2C, but switching gears to B2B, I think one thing that we've noticed, is talking to my colleagues as well, is uh, companies have invested a lot more in building these complex competency models. And that is uh, shifting towards providing skilling programs right? in terms of having a common nomenclature in terms of the skills that are needed. The distinction here is that 
you load your skill with context, with culture, et cetera, and build this comp uh, competency model, but that's not needed in the current day and age. How do you make the employability and employ employees very fluid in terms of uh, uh, the teams that they're part of? I think that's, going to, that's changing as well. All in all, this is going to create a lot of opportunities in the upskilling, reskilling space, just yeah. in yeah. professional education. And the market, I mean, everyone, all three of you have said the same, saying that the market outlook is extremely attractive and it's almost like market creation because you're redefining skilling and the need for skilling, which is on a continuous basis. On the B2B, Bayank, I don't know if you want to shed some more light no, on. I just two points there. One, Karan, because you rightly touched upon that a lot of what we spoke about was about creation of the market. So the cost of creation of the market is going to be very expensive. Yep. And therefore, I personally believe on your question that uh, what are the trends that will shift? Uh, on the K through 12, um, because we are all talking about student outcome and outcome is most important, Outcome is easiest to measure or demonstrated in an offline context. So I do believe that in the K through 12 and partly in test prep, you will see a lot more emergence <coughs> of quote unquote ed tech, when ed is first and tech is yeah. second, um, a lot of delivery shifting to offline. And we'll see more centers and more campuses coming in where delivery will happen offline, leveraging technology and making the delivery happen because from a consumer perspective, offline, demonstrates and denotes a certain level of outcome guarantee coming in. So that, I think that will happen in the offline setup. In the, in the, in the K through 12 setup, in the higher education reskilling and upskilling space, while delivery will continue to be online, I do expect market creation to move offline. Uh, so there will be acquisition of customer that may not happen on digital platform, not happen on social media, but potentially outside the hotel, outside the metro station outside the railway station where people will see and sort of get used to and accustomed to that context of skilling and reskilling and upskilling because the cost of reaching out to somebody in the digital medium is going to get prohibitively expensive. So I think that offline move of delivery on K through 12, offline move on discovery and acquisition on higher education will happen. The second that I will um, um, agree with uh, Krishna and the, one of the opportunity which I feel personally very excited about in the edtech space is how do you position India as a global talent capital of the world? Not just for India, but how do I have the maximum number of healthcare professional coming out of India going and deployed globally? How do I get the highest STEM professional going and get deployed globally? So we'll see a, uh, an emergence of stackable come um, uh, visa-based talent mobility study abroad ecosystem. So transnational education will become more and more attractive um, uh, in the context of uh, India as a market opportunity providing talent to the world. And on the B2B front, the last one I will mention is that B2B so far has been a lot about access to content. And as uh, Chaitanya mentioned that it will move towards more outcome led, that if I'm doing X, Y, Z, am I getting a uh, data science caliber person? Uh, and that shift, you will start seeing where outcomes will be measured a lot more. And outcome may not be, did you rate it four out of five or four point out five out of five? Because if you take them to a nice place, the rating goes up. If you give them a nice dinner, the rating goes up even more. So on the B2B context, you will start seeing emergence of measurable outcomes and outcomes being measured as a, uh, as a measure of success of the out program itself. Uh, just on a lighter note, because you mentioned five-year data science professional, um, there are people who are asking for eight years chat GPT experience professional. <laughs> so I think uh, people do look for unicorn in the context of skilling and reskilling all the time. Fascinating. I mean, on, the, on this um, uh, India being the uh, talent hub for the world, uh, the good news is that uh, government also is doing a lot of initiative. Like the, under NSDC, government is si signing government to government uh, MAUs to let people from India get trained and get deployed outside, and a lot of work is happening in that regard. But this whole point about India for global, we don't have enough India for India. So. Just help us, Chaitanya, I mean, uh, or Krishna. I think uh, that's very unfortunate. We, we are, uh, see, uh, growing up, the only thing that we heard in India is that getting employment is tough. At least uh, when I was uh, a school-going student, one of the biggest dreams was to get meaningful employment, right? And when we hear all this social media news, news about uh, I'm not getting uh, data professional, cloud professional, security professional, and so on, that's a very small part of India, right? How many people work in the entire tech industry in India? maybe 5 million, 6 million. We are a country of like 1.3 billion. Maybe it's, um, the data is outdated by the time I tell. We are adding 5 million every, every day. So, so employment is con continues to be a big problem. And I think uh, as, as uh, education and skilling becomes more and more accessible, hopefully we'll solve this problem for India as well as for the entire world. 
I think that's where the, uh, the aspect of education is critical in terms of one, to get uh, people to access. The second is to get them to the workforce. And uh, we, we are, um, tech talent is one thing. What you see in the new media is another thing. But it, can, it should happen across sectors. So they're extremely good uh, business models in terms of, uh, in fact, uh, uh, we as a company have invested in uh, a Held High Foundation, where they go to villages in terms of uh, train the uh, people out there, the youth out there, in terms of for them to enable them to manage Amazon fulfillment centers. Right, so I think it can take various models in terms of how education could happen, but the, the fact of the matter is that unless you can create new models in terms of getting um, people access to education, and if you look at our gross enrollment ratio, it's like 27% compared to what it is um, in China or US. And you cannot build brick and mortar universities to, uh, for the next 40 million um, graduates to happen. It has to, online has a pivotal role to play. And thanks to the government regulation with the NEP and also with foreign universities allowing them to establish uh, um, uh, campuses here, I think we are, in the, uh, we are taking the step in the right direction to yep. enable that. Yeah, no, that's a huge step. And I think, I think what we're all saying is, um, you know, the vocational education itself is huge but uh, and then if india can power not only india but in certain areas india for the world that's uh, that's highly disruptive fascinating great points i want to shift gears a little bit and talk about your businesses you all run very successful businesses and uh, everything that you, uh, you all have done is about rapid scaling and i thought my your point is we will scale in a much more uh, sensible manner where we're looking at profitable growth but just for people in the audience looking from your businesses, what's been the success behind how you manage that scalability of your business models? Because you all have grown at incredible rates. So what's the learning behind the scaling of your, of your businesses? I mean, I can just maybe if I take first. I, I, the one thing I'll tell you, I know, I mean, there's these are three businesses quite well. Uh, uh, I mean, I can tell from upgrad perspective, but I, I'm sure that I'm speaking on behalf of the other three as well. Uh, that all of them, at least for the customers, uh, whether it is a learner or whether it is a university, whether it is an institution, at least for the customers, we have stood true to the value that we are delivering. So while I know that we would have taken certain decisions, which may have been slightly more, okay, let's grow at all costs, but at the end of the day, we at no point any one of us would have compromised on the outcome that our customers would be requiring whether for certain places, better job, better shift in sort of career, getting into the best institution, um, getting the best presence felt in the ecosystem. So whichever is the customer segment, uh, I think all of us have stood true to that. And I've just realized one thing that uh, somebody emailed me uh, kind of a few days back that, look, I'm working in this company and uh, I learned something from you that whatever happens that you will go uh, bend over backwards if there's a problem with the learner and where did this DNA come in, et cetera, et cetera. And I was just thinking a lot that started on day one itself. But if that DNA exists, um, I'm sure that marketing cost, if I just measure it, consistently comes down. Delivery cost consistently comes down. But at no point you're you cheaping, cheapening out of the value proposition that you're giving to the customer. And the outcome remains the And if the outcomes you're delivering, you will start, you will see the business continue in the manner. And I think that's a common theme that you will see call it a s companies beyond a certain scale, beyond a certain threshold, that they are focused a lot on providing good quality learning, good quality education, with an eye on the outcomes. And that's the common theme that yep. we'll find in most yep. of the companies. And to your point, if you move more towards omni-channel, are we talking as a result that the scaling will come down? No, I don't think the scaling will come down. I, I mean, the, everywhere, see the, the point that you mentioned that it is becoming more offline, but even if it's becoming more offline, it's tech enabled. And uh, thus, uh, just to give a sense, uh, doing a tuition or, or center-led business, if the faculty member is at one place and you have TAs at multiple locations, you can scale up high quality faculty members to multiple locations. And there's a model to be built, uh, which is unique, uh, which is a blended model, which will allow people to sort of scale up very rapidly. And look, having an offline presence solves for the customer acquisition really well. If you, de I mean, if you decentralize delivery, that's where the challenge of scaling up comes in. But if you keep certain aspect of delivery scalable and decentralize certain other elements of delivery models, you will st seeing scale happen in the right way and it will not be a box by box growth because in that case, delivery is very, very decentralized. That's one thing that everybody has to keep in mind, that keep delivery centralized, keep things which are easy to scale on a decentralized basis and you will see scaling up happening at a rapid pace. Pratik, your view? So, uh, like, you know, for us, uh, like uh, scaling, 
like you know when like you know we started uh, acquiring user at a very early stage like you know so uh, grade 8 9 10 11 12 this is our maximum tg and uh, our uh, diversification from early test prep uh, or je neet prep to uh, the test prep uh, of a higher education like upsc ssc gate Uh, so we acquire user at a very early stage, and the most important metric for us the student NPS. Like you know, if you able to maintain great NPS across across your products, then like you know you can able to scale it very fast. Content standardization plays a key role. Yep. Like you know, everyone uh, will be aligned on this uh, on this thing. So you have to standardize your content, and you have to standardize your delivery. and like you know once once you once you have both the elements in place the content standardization and a great nps then then you are ready for scale and uh, for us this playbook is little different like you know so like you know for us communities need to scale first and you have to build a very engaging like you know deep communities uh, provide a lot of free content and generate a lot of free user base that user base translates into a paid user base so that's that's our user funnel so uh, and it takes really good time and effort to build great communities like you know there is no secret sauce to build a great community like you know you have to put in a lot of hard work like you know for for example alag started teaching on youtube uh, from 2000 uh, actively from 2016 and it it took 4 years 4 years of content of constant efforts to to build a very high captive audience on on youtube then we started monetizing it in 2020 So our story is Chinese bamboo story. Like you know, people see that like you know we are unicorn in just two, then 18 months yeah. of our operations. But like you know, we have done a lot of hard work in the past uh, to do that, to to achieve that. I think how do you keep NPS high when you've got so many new people coming in to teach? So you, that's a pretty huge challenge. So that's the secret sauce we don't share with the people. <laughs> <laughs> so like you know you you always have to uh, hear he, hear your audience and like you know they, uh, they there are some basic principles to to run a pedagogy and uh, your audience are your biggest guide like you know in terms of where they want to be and and you have to listen to your teachers and like you know so it's it's a it's a constant effort to to uh, build a great nps and and it's the most important metric for 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 any, everyone out here krishna what do you see the next few years how will you how will you scale the business what are you expecting so karan um, for my perspective i think first taking a step back and your question was that uh, how how we guys scale compared to many other com- people who tried uh, almost at the same time so like any online business starting is easy scaling is not that uh, easy so i think uh, the most important factor when i look from simply on perspective was our, our team the kind of <laughs> team member that we assembled from day one and they were stuck together for all these years was like uh, exceptional and not only in terms of caliber but, but but also in terms of like passion to do work in this another area right see there are many industries where you can grow you can build your career but education and maybe healthcare are are couple of industries where while you grow and build business there's also this fulfillment that you are doing something good so that is associated with our industry also so that was that is one thing that we in the beginning when we started hiring we started looking for people with a similar kind of uh, outlook towards life so that has really helped now i think uh, if i look at last 12 years of our journey lot of things have worked lot of things have not worked right so we are trying to identify what worked what didn't work try to avoid what didn't work and try to amplify what worked it's very easy uh, easier said than done because every day there are so many different challenges there are so many different priorities that many times you make mistake and only when it stops firing at you you yeah. realize that okay that was a wrong decision right so i think now uh, in, internally itself we have so much of know how all the uh, good things are like very easily uh, understandable that focus on customer outcome try to like be um, uh, try to like uh, not get carried away b- uh, um, by what's happening in the all around you but when in when it comes to day to day work you forget you generally try to like in in, in the rush to move fast in rush to do things it somehow get deprioritized and you just get carried away right so what we are trying to tell to uh, what i'm trying to tell myself every day as well as my team that okay let's think before we act let's not be in a yeah. hurry because everybody has uh, everybody around us is doing it right in fact at simply learn we are pretty much uh, one one like uh, uh, program in a way we are running is that get back to 2020 
this is actually a program that we are running that get back to 2020. So let's identify what all we were doing till 2020. We just start go and start following that. And yeah. forget about what we did in 21, 22. Got it. Chitanya, I want to shift gears a little bit. You have a, you have created a phenomenal global business, right? Help us a little bit saying, what are the elements of the business model that allow for globalization, standardization, and which are the elements that are much more regional or local? Uh, help us think through, you know, your, your journey and just maybe a little bit more how you've, how you, because you were telling me about, you know, your footprint is LATAM, is US, it's Europe, it's India, it's Southeast Asia. You, you truly are global here. Yeah. Um, so when we started this in 2010, right, it was not that we, were, it, it was deliberate that we're going to build, uh, have a global footprint. Right now we have, say, 300,000 learners from 200 countries. I think it's fundamental, the, to the point that my uncle also mentioned, is the, the access to high quality education or the need for high quality education, that's a universal need. Global. It's not uh, restricted to India or US or, uh, or parts of Europe, right? I think that's what has uh, uh, the mission, what we had as a mission in terms of providing access to high quality education that has enabled us organically to look at uh, regions beyond India, although we started in India to start off. And uh, in terms of uh, how we scale or uh, the globalization aspect also, uh, how we became global um, is current, we have a, we follow a simple framework. We are quite fortunate to uh, listen in close quarters to thought leaders and thereby make courses with them. It's called a three box thinking. What we have is that we have a performance engine which is basically which generates the cash, the profits for us to invest in future initiatives. What we call the box one. The second point is we have to, uh, what Krishna was mentioning is about you need to, f once you go from zero to one, um, I think you have certain capabilities, but they might not, might or might not help you to take you from one to 10. So you have to unlearn uh, certain aspects or destroy some of the processes. So that we are very, very cognizant about in terms of how can we cannibalize ourselves in terms of process. The third thing which has helped us in a global footprint is what we call creating the future is that how, for example, when we think of uh, uh, China as a new geography, so we made them uh, not align to any of the metrics, performance metrics that the rest of the company follows. Mm. It has its own metrics, it has a very different team, more fundamentally is that it has local leadership because me sitting in um, in India or France, etc., I have no clue the regulatory environment or how the customer behaves, what the customer needs, right, or what are the kind of uh, uh, dynamics of the school ecosystem there. So one is we create, we have a universal opportunity. Second, we enable, uh, we identify local leadership, enable them, and give them that autonomy to run it. And uh, I think that's what uh, you know enabled us to do uh, what we have done. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. I think you all have all touched upon when we spoke about the future of EdTech in terms of what's happening on the innovation side and how you guys are innovating. But just more, if I step back, and you guys are all great examples of what we would call scale insurgents. And you guys are working on you know, getting the net benefits of size and also getting the benefits of uh, what we would call the founder's mentality, which is speed, which is intimacy that you talked about with NPS. Uh, which is really about um, you know getting an agile business model that embodies the you know what you are when you're very small and that's the benefit of scaling as well. Just uh, one of the big things we find is we have to be thinking about delivery and we have to be thinking about development at the same time. So how does your operating model allow you to deliver today's business when you have you know, to satisfy um, you know all the metrics that we talked about? But also, how do you think about development at the same time? And talk a little bit about the innovation that you guys are pursuing that we should be looking forward towards. Yeah. I can take it first. So on the innovation part, this is touching upon what I mentioned earlier is that how can you create an innovation, innovative team or a process or a product which is not linked to, don't link it to how you're operating currently. I think that's the fundamental uh, premise that we go with. Uh, for example, let's say uh, chat GPT. I think everybody talks about yep. it. Now, there are a lot of use cases. Uh, maybe there's a use case in terms of how can you provide uh, far more intelligent transcripts of the courses to the learners. And that to a different levels of learning. Right? I think there is a, a, a new Sula which, is, which does that quite, uh, quite interestingly in the K-12 curriculum. So uh, the, the point of the exercise is that we, you don't take an existing team in, and try uh, 
um, ask them to uh, do it and put it on the current uh, um, uh, student population, can you create a separate team, you know, give them a, a very distinct incentive, be it on uh, chat GPT application either for grading or for course creation, et cetera, and run with it, start a pilot, and if it works, scale it, otherwise kill it. Right. I think it, one has so to be... So you have absolutely different teams that are working yeah. on innovative ideas, yeah. completely different from the delivery. Yeah. Um, that's, that's one way how we look at it. Yeah, so Karan, so what I noticed at least at Simply Learn is that, see, it's not uh, like you need to do this in, in isolation. So, so we, across many functions, across many uh, processes, what we realized was that something that was working perfectly fine till about a year back starts breaking. And that's where we need to re-engineer and start thinking that if I had to do this all over again, how will I go about doing it, right? So I think, so innovation is not, ne not necessarily a big bang idea that you think in isolation and then go and implement across the organization. You are innovating every day. And that's what makes companies like, uh, I'll say, um, uh, that's, that's a competitive advantage that every day you're make it learning, making incremental imp uh, improvement improve and, and and changing your process and trying to become better than yesterday. So we look at innovation as a is an incremental everyday work, not not really a, a separate function, and then come and implement everywhere else. So it's quite cultural, actually. Yeah, it's quite cultural, and and as you grow, things start breaking. We realize that right? many yeah. times we sometimes we want to accept that okay, what what we did earlier was not correct or not thought through, and sometimes we realize that okay, this is just because of the scale of the business. Maybe things have changed environment around us has changed and hence there is a need to for us to change and be ready for the new reality. We have uh, very little time. Uh, there's two questions I want to get to. I think we'll be remiss to not talk about how can we impact uh, India and the opportunity in India. So from your vantage point, with such terrible G, uh, enrollment ratios, we've talked a lot about outcomes that you're achieving, but we know the employability numbers are terrible. So what can you all do as pioneers to impact India when it comes to whether it's vocational education or K through 12, what would be your suggestions? From a company perspective yeah. or from a Company and... Um, no, I think... And, uh, and a EdTech leadership perspective. No, so uh, on a few points there, Karan, that one is uh, while as part of the business there is a, a sort of outcome that gets covered. Uh, um, as a regular practice, we do audit outcomes. I mean, outcomes are audited like a financial audit that one goes through in the organization and an external entity sort of comes and measures and audits that play. But for us, while we have realized that if we are a for-profit entity, uh, going beyond a certain means has always been a challenge and therefore we have set up a separate foundation and that foundation focuses on not-for-profit work and gets programmed to reach to a last mile which otherwise hmm. cannot be reached with the current sort of boundary conditions and that's one approach that we are taking and the second one is whatever that we are doing we are actually encouraging our existing employees to also go and teach and also sort of take it to a larger scale but whatever that you do don't do it just for the sake of doing it but measure it and audit and report it back that's great to Thank hear sorry, sorry, the, sorry to interrupt but up. i think i think time's up and we're running a tight ship here so unfortunately we'll have to con continue this conversation upstairs with drinks later drinks in the glass now. house so thank, thank you so much. This was an incredible panel. <laughs> the future of EdTech is bright indeed. Thank you so much.